I guess you're having a great morning. I'm enjoying this morning as well. And uh, those who have not taken a drink or a bite, in short, breakfast, you are encouraged to do so. But you are aware that this is a breakfast meeting, so we shall meet as we drink and eat. How about that? So, but in the meantime, I think it is proper and fit that we start our meeting. And I would like uh, the following to be on the table, uh, on the high table, so to speak. So I want to request uh, Honorable Richard Oporot uh, to get uh, up on the, on the high table. Yes. And uh, Honorable Flavia Kabahenda as well. Could you please uh, get on the high table as well? And I would like our facilitator today, uh, Mr. David Lambert Mwesije, uh, to also uh, find space uh, at the high table. So, all your members, ladies and gentlemen, you are most welcome to uh, this meeting. And in short, this meeting is a simple uh, orientation exercise, basically on the work of the Uganda Parliamentary Forum on Social Protection. And we shall have a very interactive uh, session uh, in which we shall be exposed to uh, information uh, on the subject matter of social protection but also uh, get an opportunity to ask questions and receive feedback on the same. So I would like to request a volunteer to lead us in a word of prayer uh, before we can commence uh, today's proceedings. May I have a volunteer to lead us in a word of prayer? And uh, where I don't usually get a volunteer, I know the most prayerful person in the room, at least personally, Honorable Babadiri, is usually comes to my rescue in moments like this. So, Okay, so I Hello. Hello, hello. Hello. Okay. Okay. Uh, let us have ourselves to pray. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God Almighty Father. We thank you for the life you have given us. We thank you for the opportunities you have given us all the time we are alive. We thank you for bringing us safely from our homes to this very important meeting. God Almighty Father, we have come here for a purpose. Guide us throughout this meeting so that we realize and achieve what we have come for. And we work for the good of older persons and other 
vulnerable people, we ask this through Christ our Lord. Uh, thank you very much, Honorable Babadi. I propose that you give her a very good hand clap. Yes, she always comes to our rescue when uh, we lack volunteers to lead us in the world of prayer. So without much further ado, I would like to request uh, the Honorable Chairperson of the Uganda Parliamentary Forum, uh, Richard Oporot, uh, to give us the welcome remarks. You are most welcome, Honorable. Uh, thank you very much, Patrick. Uh, this, this, this microphone was uh, less like I should talk while seated, but I find it very hard to do so. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, Master of Ceremonies, honorable members of Parliament, the technical staff here, ladies and gentlemen, I welcome you all to this very important and useful breakfast meeting where we shall interact and share uh, a glimpse of what we do and what we are as Uganda Parliamentary Forum on Social Protection. I once more want to thank you who have braved the morning hardship to be here by now. And for that, I thank you. Uh, I am called Okolot Jacob Richards. I chair, as of now, the Parliamentary Program on Social Protection. And uh, I'm also hopeful that very soon we'll be having an election where we shall have new leadership, but as of now, I'm, I'm the chair. I want to introduce uh, Honorable Badiri, Honorable Badiri who has just led us into a prayer. Uh, can you tell us your position, a representative for? Yeah. Yes. Yes, I, I think. Yeah. I, uh, Honorable Badiri and I, the ninth parliament, but was officially launched and ending very soon. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, honorable members, we will, I will request that at some point we shall have a comprehensive introduction where each and every person will uh, get known to all of us. The staff of the forum and the staff of parliament, members of parliament, and all other stakeholders will be here. This forum started in 2012 under uh, the ninth parliament but was officially launched in February 2014. And it is an advocacy forum of or platform of members of parliament. In the 10th parliament, we were 250 members and it was the most uh, uh, attractive and highly uh, subscribed forum and uh, I am hopeful that this will pick up again especially after these activities and engagements with you. The forum was conceived to advocate for resources for social protection within and outside parliament. You as members of parliament hold that critical role of allocating resources, but also of lobbying resources. So as a forum, we advocate within and outside parliament to provide oversight and monitoring 
implementation of social protection activities. And when we talk of social protection, we are looking at it from a broader perspective. Uh, interestingly, we have been narrowed down on the only SAGE because of the active uh, role of SAGE in the minds of many people. But we look at all categories of vulnerable persons and the interventions uh, addressing them. And also be a face and voice of social protection at the highest level of government. As a parliamentary forum, there is, there is, there is no other organ that can speak or represent, speak for or represent uh, social protection at the highest level of government. Parliament, you put pressure on the executive and you put pressure on all other actors because you have that platform and therefore we put the forum to do that. The forum is led by a board that I uh, have said whose term is ending. Uh, ordinarily it's supposed to end in January, but we think that uh, that is too far. We may have to do the elections a little earlier so that uh, we have the current sitting members of parliament actively involved in steering this aspect. It's also not good to keep a forum uh, mobilizing members and the uh, they think they are being mobilized by those who are, not, and who are no longer part of them. But it's also good that the new people also keep the vehicle moving. So we hope to have the elections uh, sooner than uh, should be. And uh, what activities do we do? One, uh, we influence policies and laws on social protection. Uh, we are, we are we, we, as a forum, we are, we are first of all, uh, one forum which is non-political, all-inclusive, and, and also we are uh, a forum that looks at social protection from a broader perspective, and therefore we are keenly interested in all those laws and policies that touch on social protection. And uh, we equip members of the forum with the knowledge and information about the requisite national and international best practices on social protection. Uh, for your information, at one time, uh, this sage we are proud about was being scrapped. But uh, the forum pushed until even His Excellency and his cabinet had to rethink and abandon the scrapping of this. And it is on. Yeah? We also have to create space for members to harmonize, engage, and develop monitoring frameworks for social protection policy. We have the social protection policy in place, and the members have to be involved and understand and have their views 
uh, captured. Uh, we routinely disseminate results of studies, reviews, legislation, and related social protection uh, issues. These meetings will continue uh, at different levels so that we can share the different findings, the different lessons learned from researches, from engagements, so that we can champion the advocacy for social protection from an informed uh, point of view. Uh, we also champion advocacy for social protection financing. And our strategic in interventions here to align the forum's work within the budget processes in the parliament. We are engaging you because you are key in processing the budget. And for you to be uh, effective, you must be engaged prior and throughout the process of the national budget. And therefore, as a forum, this is an activity that we have to do continuously. We also share evidence on the rationale and benefits of social protection to lobby the highest levels of government and development partners. You know, when I, I, had, I had just come to Parliament and we were talking about to forming this forum and uh, telling many people about the importance of this forum, there were people who were asking, but what is, what is 20,000? What is 25,000? That is just a plate of food, a meal. Sorry. So how can you say that uh, as a... A forum you are just advocating for giving people 25,000 which can do nothing but from the field activities we gathered evidence that we shared with people and even the doubting Thomases now believe that this program is very useful and the 25,000 is more useful than they actually think but if you do not gather the, the facts and information to share with the people, you cannot be able to convince them. So, honorable members, ladies and gentlemen, when we talk of social protection, sometimes people take it for granted, but not because they understand it so well, but because they have very little information. And therefore, information being power should be provided to all of us so that we can understand and embrace whatever uh, we are undertaking. We also do capacity building, conducting training for program members and staff, and undertaking study tours and exchange visits in the region and abroad. We pushed for the national rollout. I told you that uh, in one meeting, we were proudly informed that the president had finally accepted to scrap the social, the, the sage. And we said, no, for us, we are pushing for a national rollout. And today, we have a national rollout that we must strengthen by thinking of the consideration of the age bracket and also eventually the term so ladies and gentlemen I, I i i i i know we shall have a lot more engagements and uh, since we are talking of this as a breakfast meeting i want to uh, cut my uh, brief really short but emphasize that we hope to have field activities so that we can do the monitoring of the uh, social protection activities in the field 
and be able to come back and based on our findings to convince other stakeholders as well. Uh, Honorable members, as a forum, we count on you first of all. And uh, even the stakeholders out there look unto the members of parliament as a basis for their decisions. This forum and its focus has been a very captivating thing to many stakeholders. And therefore, it is very important that we try to keep the fire burning so that the stakeholders in the social protection agenda remain part of us and continue supporting us so that our people can be served better. The interesting thing about the forum is that when we talk about stakeholders and financing, it's not money that comes to the forum. It's money that comes to the government coffers. It's money that the government mobilizes and puts into its budget to finance social protection. Sometimes when you talk as a forum, some people may have the thinking that, no, this money is coming to these people and they are the ones who implement activities. No, we lobby, we advocate so that the money comes into the budget to implement these social protection activities for the good of the vulnerable. I want to uh, once more thank you for coming and expressing the interest in this forum. We hope to have more engagements. And uh, at this point, I want to wish us a very nice engagement this morning. And uh, Mr. MC, I end my presentation at that. And thank you, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Honorable Oparot. I think he deserves another round of applause. I think he has uh, set the ball uh, rolling. Uh, when we were starting, uh, I think we missed uh, one important activity, and that is self-introduction. And I don't think we actually deliberated, rather we missed it, but it was deliberate that uh, some of you have just come in. Don't miss that very important uh, activity. So for members who have just joined us, uh, you are most welcome. And our session uh, is already underway. Uh, my name is uh, Patrick Chichoncho Katawazi, and I coordinate the activities of the Uganda Parliamentary Forum on Social Protection. And I'll be leading you uh, in the discussions uh, here today. So I am going to pass the microphone. Uh, uh, so that we can introduce ourselves. Uh, it would be very important to know the name, uh, the constituency or office that you serve in, and, and where possible with the committee that you sit on, that would be very, very, very important. I So I, I want to suggest that we make self-introductions not through the microphone, but you just be audible and, and mention your name. So we are going to start with this table of uh, Honorable Babadiri.
Yes, uh, all right, we are going to use the microphone now. The solution has been found. I'm a Pai Susan, assistant to Honor Babadir. My name is Chia Gahirare Innocent, MP Maokota North. I sit on the Committee of Gender and I'm um, the Arts Shadow Minister. I'm the Shadow Minister for Arts and Culture. Good to be here. Uh, for those who don't know, is the famous Dr. Hilda Mann of the famous Mazongoto. Uh, good morning, colleagues. Um, I am Dr. Sime Florence Akiki, commonly known as the Dancing Queen, woman in PMC district, and a member on gender committee. Good morning, members. I'm called Irene Linda Mugisa, woman member of parliament representing the people of Porto City and a member of gender committee. Good morning, everybody. My name is Muhaye Miriam. I represent the people of Bali district. And I'm a member on the Gender Committee and Equal Opportunities. Good to be here this morning. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Alan Mayanja, I'm representing people of uh, Nakaseke Central. I'm a man of gender sensitive. That's why I'm on gender committee. I'm also on human rights committee. I'm glad to be here. Yeah, good morning, honorable members. I am called Peter Ken Lochap, member of parliament of Bokora East County in the Park District, Ramaja Sub Region, and I'm a member on, on Gender Committee. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Dr. Patrick Mutono. I represent the people of Butebo County and a member of the Budget Committee. Thank you. Uh, Paul O'Mara is my name. Uh, my member of Parliament for Otuke County. I'm a member of Finance Planning and Economic Development Committee and also a member of the Budget Committee. Happy to be here. Good morning, honorable members. I'm Uchigundu Suleiman, Director, Budget Office. Morning, honorable members. I'm Francis Sabiti from the Parliamentary Budget Office. Hello, good morning everyone. My name is Mohamed Mpuga, clerk assistant and clerk to the Committee on Gender, Labor and Social Development. Morning everyone, I'm Marina Barunji, clerk to Budget Committee. Good morning everyone, my name is Jackie Birunji, legal counsel to the Committee on Gender. Good morning, everyone. I am Suba Von. My name is work with the Forum Secretariat. Morning, everyone. I'm called Choncho Janet, sitting in the Speaker's office. Good morning, members. 
Chitanywa Soed is my name. I represent the people of Songora North County in Kasese District. I sit on the Human Rights and Gender Committee. Thank you. Good morning, uh, members. My name is Semwanga Javira. I represent Buyamba County in Rakai District. I'm a member of the Budget Committee. Morning, everybody. I'm Rabshija Margaret. I member a member of Parliament representing workers. I sit on the Appointments Committee and the Gender, Labour, and Social Development. Good morning. I'm Dixon Kateshumba, member of Parliament for Shema Municipality and the member of the Budget Committee. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Gloria Nakajubi. I'm in charge of communications at the Uganda Parliamentary Forum on Social Protection. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Nicholas Wasaja. I write for the New Vision. My name is Katsime Anet Mudisha, the woman member of Parliament, Bushenyi District. I'm on the Budget Committee. Good morning, everyone. I'm Kala Kevin Ojinga, the district woman representative for Palisa District, and uh, I'm a member of Gender Committee and Park Central. Uh, thank you very much for your introductions, and I think now we know who is here. Perhaps the only person that has not introduced himself, I am going to have the privilege of introducing him. Honorable Morris uh, Chibadia, you are most welcome. And uh, Honorable Morris uh, Chibadia is the member uh, of the board of the Uganda Parliamentary Reform and Social Protection. Uh, representing Eastern Uganda. And on that note, uh, the chairperson has requested that you take his seat on the high table. May you please uh, join Honorable Flavia uh, on the high table. Now, the next item uh, on our program uh, is a presentation that is seeking to equip us with knowledge on social protection. It will give insights on the subject matter uh, of social protection, its dynamics, uh, the recent trends in the sector, financing, and many other aspects. So I will request you to be very attentive because as you know, some of these concepts are not only new, but they, they are very dynamic. They keep changing and it will be very important that members who have turned up utilize this opportunity to uh, understand in great detail uh, the subject matter of social protection. I want to welcome Honorable members for making it. I also want to welcome the staff of parliament led by the director, budget office, and other colleagues from budget office where I served for, uh, for, for nine years. Uh, Mr. Chigundu, thank you very much 
uh, for coming to this meeting. I, 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 I would like to request that we give a hand clap to the staff for coming to, and especially so when you have a director of budget office, this speaks volumes because most of the work that relate with budget, uh, all the budgets from social committees have an input from officers and staff uh, in the budget office, and, and, and we think this is very, very, very important. So our keynote presenter today uh, is a man of experience in social protection. Uh, he started expanding social protection uh, program in Uganda as a technical uh, officer in 2011. He has been very prominent uh, in social protection matters in Africa as a whole, and he has worked in promoting social protection intervention and programs uh, in Ghana and many other African countries. And today, uh, he heads advocacy at international level for Save the Children uh, International on Social Protection and Poverty Matters. So allow me to introduce none other than David Lambert to Mwesiji. Thank you very much, Patrick, and good morning, honorable members, ladies and gentlemen. I'm extremely delighted to be here today because um, next to my family, this is the most important thing to me. This is my purpose in life. So talking to honorable members of parliament about a subject I believe is fundamental to Uganda's transformation is extremely important to me, as I believe it is important to our country. So, as Patrick mentioned, I'm delighted to talk to you about this subject of social protection, which I would like us to start framing as that tool that can enable us to enhance human capital. Because Uganda is a very young country, the bulk of our population are children. But I dare say that as a country, we are under investing in our children. And if we want to become the middle income country that Vision 2040 suggests, we cannot do it unless we can population across the life cycle. And so this is really what gives me a lot of um, excitement, but also challenge. So as Patrick mentioned, I recently joined Save the Children as the Global Advocacy Manager for Child Poverty. But actually, my work is to promote social protection and support Save the Children, build its capacity, because social protection is critical to achieving our goals, as you will see them. Uh, but I also actually advocate to the entire world for this. So being able to have a chance to do it on my own turf in Uganda with people with the next biggest power after the president, because I've been with this process 
I've been with Honorable Babadiri, I've been with um, Honorable uh, Kabahenda. I know what it takes, and I know where power lies in Uganda. And these two committees, the Budget Committee and the Gender, Labor and Social Development Committee, can, if they want, transform Uganda's human capital. So, please allow me to ask you to pay attention because for the next five years, I would like you to prioritize this as we have prioritized investment in infrastructure and energy. It's time to invest in our human capital as well. I would like also to congratulate you because I know the election this year was a tough one. So you've definitely emerged as the best and the brightest. And so I'm also confident. And I think I speak for the Parliamentary Forum because we've been this journey together that you can help us to win this um, war on poverty. So at Save the Children, our ambition is to put children and young people at the heart of action. And because they are the main beneficiaries, and we want to support them and reduce poverty. In that way, we want to strengthen low and insecure incomes and food insecurity, which prevents children from surviving. I'm sure all of you are familiar with our infant mortality rates in Uganda. Learning, you understand the failure rates in our education system. You know how many children are, are not in school, but also being protected, which is an important channel for stopping the transmission of poverty to future generations. I will demonstrate throughout this presentation how much Uganda is extremely vulnerable to poverty. At Save the Children, we commit to providing caregivers of children with sufficient income at all times to meet their essential needs of the children because this is important to their survival, learning, and protection. I'll keep repeating these words. We all know that across all societies, poor families are resilient against disasters and shocks, continue to invest in their children, survival, learning, and protection. Let me say this again. In all societies, there is a typo here. Families who are not poor are resilient against disasters and shocks and continue to invest in their children. In all societies, we know that adolescent girls and boys who are deprived have the opportunity to build their skills, network, and self-esteem because they need to make that transition to safe and decent lives. And we also commit that we will support countries to adopt national and subnational monitoring and action plans. So poverty is a big thing uh, at Save the Children, and I am delighted to talk to you about what we want to do to poverty. Um, I will not talk about this slide, but basically what we're talking about is in our 2022-24 strategy at Save the Children, we are responding to the challenge of the triple threat of COVID-19, which hit us from last year. Conflict, we deal a lot with conflict situations and climate change. In fact, at the beginning of this month, we launched our groundbreaking climate report. Please, if you can, go look for it. It really shows a very grim picture of the future. And Uganda is highly vulnerable to climate change. Now, when we talk about poverty, often when you look at the reports from UBOS, the ones we are familiar with, they normally talk about income poverty. But poverty is multidimensional because it also includes health and nutrition poverty, educational poverty, the inadequate standards of living, insecure incomes, disempowerment, harmful work, and threats of violence for children. And sadly, poverty hits children the hardest. And it has a lifelong impact. The impacts of poverty on children are profound than adults, more profound than for adults, and they actually inflict 
irreversible damage. So, every time you see a child who is struggling to learn, it might be interesting to look at their background because if you lose your ability to learn before 1,000 days, it's very hard to recover that. And a lot of children, 29% of children in Uganda under five stunted. And that's an indicator of that irreversible damage. I don't want to spend a lot of time on COVID-19, but it has shed a light on the urgency with which we need to tackle child poverty. So action is needed now more than ever. Because in 2019, before COVID, 585 million children in the world were living in poverty, monetary poverty. In 2020, after COVID, it was projected that 117 million more children were likely to fall into poverty. I think we've seen that happen. Unfortunately, most of these numbers, if you look at that map, honorable members, most of these people are actually on our continent. So this is a Pan-African issue. And so, members who are familiar with colleagues who are from other parts of the continent, the Interparliamentary Union, this is an agenda that we can actually share with them. As Patrick introduced me, I've been working at the Expanding Social Protection Program actually since 2010. <coughs> and through the SAGE program, we actually generated a lot of evidence. Cash transfers are the best evidence anti-poverty measure available in the world. And it's also an important part of the humanitarian response everywhere in the world. In northern Uganda, where we're hosting a lot of refugees and, and southwestern Uganda. And in fact, as Save the Children, we have something we call Cash Plus, which is basically a combination of cash so with a behavioral change communication, which helps to impact children's outcomes. We talk a lot about child benefits because it's a key part of the social protection laws, which is part of the SDG target uh, 1.3 and the Child Rights Convention. And the reason we promote cash is because cash can help the multiple, reduce the multiple dimensions of poverty. It can help children to learn because it helps children to stay in school, increases enrollment and reduces dropouts. Because even when education is free, when children do not have scholastic materials, when children don't have clothes, when children are hungry, they don't benefit from that. It helps children to survive. Nourishment comes from income security. If you don't have money, you don't have food. So cash is king for survival. And it also means a lot for child protection because cash can help reduce incidents of child marriage. The reason people give their children away into marriage is because, in my experience, they are looking for that dowry. And they give away children because they want to benefit financially from it. So when they have that income security, you can reduce that. So that's enough about Save the Children. But I introduced Save because we are very ambitious as an organization. And we really want to create breakthroughs for children. We want children to learn. We want them to survive. And we want them to be protected. And we would like to do it with you as honorable members of parliament. We support the government of Uganda in its aspiration to build a vibrant workforce, a productive workforce, because that's how we can sustain Uganda's growth in the future in an equitable way. Because our, as you will see, our inequality levels are going up. So I want to spend just a few minutes to talk about social protection because this is... Um, 
a confusing concept. Throughout my time at the ESP program in the Ministry of Gender, people thought because we provide universal primary education and universal health education, that was social protection. It is not. Poverty reduction measures contribute to resilient families. They contribute to income security, but they are not social protection. They are complementary. And so let me explain what social protection is. There are different definitions from different agencies, and I don't want to dwell on these. But the key running theme about these programs is that they aim to sustain an adequate standard of living. They aim to improve the ability of families to cope with risks and shocks. And they also help people to claim their rights and enhance their social that's the Save the Children definition. It's the same for UNICEF. It's about protecting people against poverty and vulnerability. It's about protecting people from social exclusion throughout their life course. The World Bank talks about programs and policies and systems that help individuals and societies to manage risks and volatility and protect them from poverty and destitution. And this is the most commonly used um, definition by the Social Protection Interagency Operation Board. It is that set of policies and programs aimed at preventing or preventing people against poverty, vulnerability, social exclusion, and blessing particular emphasis on vulnerable groups and it can be provided either in cash or in kind through contributory schemes such as the NSSF or the parliamentary pension scheme which you are esteemed members of. They can be categorical such as SAGE which is for older persons, they could be for children or people with disabilities or they can actually be poverty targeted. Different countries do it differently but they all aim to build human capital, productive assets, and access to jobs. Um, this diagram basically shows all the different things that comprise social protection. So the objectives are to protect families, to prevent destitution, and to promote livelihoods. And this can come in form of income transfers, such as the cash, and this can be unconditional, such as the payments we make uh, through the SAGE program. Uh, they, in other countries, they are conditional. It also includes social pensions, uh, but it also includes things like the public service pension scheme. It includes fee, fee waivers. Uh, people, especially during COVID, most countries waived certain fees. In Uganda, we waived um, uh, user fees in hospitals, although um, most people go to private. Um, clinics in the government hospitals. It also includes insurance, health insurance, but also social um, uh, insurance, such as uh, in especially Francophone countries. And this could be universal for everybody, especially in the OECD countries um, in Western Europe, mainly, um, and Americas. Uh, if you are an old person, you automatically receive a pension a minimum. That's the way they reduce poverty through the social protection system in these countries. And I'll show you some graphs there. Or it can be targeted at a certain group, either poor households, disabled people, food insecure people, children, informal workers, uh, displaced people, mothers, fathers, elderly people. It really depends on what your policy objective is. And they actually cause a lot of very good impact. I'll talk about this when we talk about Uganda itself. This, um, I will not talk about it, but basically this is uh, what we call the life cycle approach to social protection. It covers child benefits, maternity benefits, basically for when a mother conceives their child until they give birth to the child and raise them. Um, 
so this is child sensitive all social protection that is designed to maximize benefits for children in the families that receive that is um child sensitive social protection but in the interest of time i do not want to spend a lot of time on this because i will share these slides you can actually look at them so where does social protection derive its mandate as a concept in fact social protection has been here especially in the developed uh, um, and high income countries and middle income countries a lot of them as you'll see already uh, deliver social protection as a basic and core government service just like health or education but it's anchored in the universal declaration of human rights article 25 i'll actually show it to you on the next slide verbatim and uganda has actually ratified a number of international agreements on social protection for instance, there is the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights. We have the Convention on the Rights of the Child, Convention on Elimination of Discrimination Against Women, Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. These are very important uh, uh, international commitments on social protection. Now, when I was reading Article 25, I really found it very interesting because when you look at the number of people that have no access to social protection, the number of people that live in poverty that could be solved by social protection, it's really amazing that this declaration, which was signed so many decades ago, says that everyone has a right to a standard of living that's adequate for their health, their well-being, including food clothing, housing, and medical care and necessary social services, and the right to security in the event of unemployment, sickness, disability, widowhood, old age, and lack of livelihoods in circumstances beyond their control. So everybody, including ourselves, are vulnerable, and they have a right to that protection. And at this point, I actually want to pause and reflect. So... For a moment last year, I was unemployed. And then at the same time, my mother got a stroke. I needed to raise a lot of money together with my siblings to take care of that. Millions of money. Honorable members, you know how much it cost us to treat COVID patients and most families were on their own and yet they have a right to health and well-being so think about those people who could not afford to get that access and this is exactly why we need to strengthen the social protection system including social health protection now i say that in oecd countries most of the developed countries this graph shows the development of social protection programs that are anchored in national legislation before 1900 up to 2020. And you can see that everybody is trying to cover. In some countries, they are at 100% for several, several years. And in Uganda, we are really, really still behind. Because social protection is so important, it's actually one of the first indicators. So the third indicator under SDG1, which is about reducing poverty, is a target to implement national, nationally appropriate. They know that countries are different, but at every level of development, countries should implement appropriate social protection systems and measures for all including minimum flaws and by 2030 to achieve substantial coverage of the poor and vulnerable however when you look at the levels of coverage it is sad i put this chart here because i wanted to show you how bad things are in africa so if you look at the population that's covered by at least one social protection benefit globally, it's 
for pensions, it's the highest, 77.5%. And the number of vulnerable people covered by social assistance programs such as SAGE is just 28.9. That's globally. If you look at Africa, older persons 27% compared to 77.5. Social assistance, 9.3. Uganda is actually less than 1%. So we have a lot of work to do to enhance coverage of social protection. These are numbers that most of you honorable members will be familiar with. We have an objective to end poverty. SDG 1 is about ending poverty in all its forms. But COVID has led to the first rise in extreme poverty in a generation because up to 124 million people fell into extreme poverty in 2020. 120 million people. The global poverty rate was projected to increase to 7% in 20, by 2030 because of COVID. As I mentioned, a lot of countries are investing in social protection, but it's not enough progress because it's just 46.9% of the global population who are effectively covered by at least one social protection benefit. And Africa is much, much worse. Because of COVID, the financing gap to provide a minimum social protection flow has also increased. We need the world needs 30 percent the financing gap has increased to approximately 30 percent of gdp because of covid 19. we need 362.9 billion in lower middle income countries to cover people with social protection and in low income countries we need 77.9 billion that's about 15.9% of GDP. So we have a lot of work to do. And these graphs are from the World Social Protection Report by the International Labor Office. It was uh, published just recently. And they've given us two options. So as countries, we can choose to take the high road, which enables more people to have social protection, which means we strengthen social protection systems. That is introduce universal social protection, provide adequate benefits, provide a bigger range of benefits. You know, honorable, honorable members, you know, NSSF members have been asking for early access and all these other things. That's part of the high road. Provision of rights-based and inclusive social protection. Most people don't have a right to social protection until recently when you decided that other people should benefit from NSSF. Only workers with employees, employers with five or more employees were eligible for NSSF. SAGE covers just a fraction of the older persons in Uganda. So the right social protection is the high road, guaranteeing that right. The low road is we can continue to neglect social protection through underinvestment, saying we don't have money, but we have money for infrastructure and energy as if these things are binary if you build roads if you build electricity and the majority of your people cannot use it my economics tells me that you're not optimizing the return on that investment so you're wasting that money also we are crying of taxes because it's just a few of us paying the taxes the tax base is small because there are very few people with jobs, there are very few people with adequate incomes. We can invest in our human capital so that in future we have more people paying more tax and building the economy. So now that we know why social protection is important and what it can do, what does Uganda's social protection system look like? In 2015, the Ministry of Gender submitted a policy to cabinet which was approved. 
together with this program plan of intervention. It expired last year, and the government is actually now revising it. The National Development Plan, the third NDP3, also recognizes social protection as an important tool for building human capital because it's an essential demand side investment in people which can promote a healthier citizenry and a more dynamic economy. If 30% of our children are stunted honorable members, they can never achieve their full potential. And if they can't achieve their full potential, we will struggle to raise the money we need to take this country to the next level. So we must invest in our people now, and the NDP3 recognizes that. The Minister of Gender has also started drafting um, a long-term strategy for social protection. They have a draft vision for social security. I'll share it with you. And they are committing to achieve child-sensitive outcomes because we also have a national action plan for nutrition. We also have a national integrated early childhood development action plan. So we really are keen to promote uh, nutrition-sensitive out um, and child-sensitive outcomes in our development, but we still have a lot of work to go. So this is the policy. It outlines a very broad vision, the National Protection Policy of 2015, and it aims for a society where all individuals are secure and resilient to social economic risks and shocks. Its objectives are, one, to increase access to social security, to more people, and social security is defined as either direct income support such as SAGE or contributory schemes such as the NSSF. It also aims to enhance care and support for those vulnerable people that are not able to provide for themselves, but it also aims to build a very comprehensive system which is an institutional framework for service delivery. So this diagram illustrates how social protection aligns with all the other things that we do to develop our country. So in the outer ring, we've got education, water and sanitation. We've got emergency work. We've got livelihood support. We've got infrastructure programs, energy, health and employment. All these things, they help to build resilient families. But there is a very clear niche for social protection, and it's either social security, which is direct income support, or social insurance, and this is importantly, we also want to take care of the informal sector workers. There is no reason why a government official who is paid for by the taxpayer has a pension, and the woman in Kalerwe who is paying their taxes, feeding the nation, is left to suffer on their own. So we really have to make sure that everybody is taken care of. So we want an inclusive social protection system. That's what the policy would like to do. This graphic, <coughs> sorry, this graphic, <coughs> sorry, this graphic shows the benefits of an inclusive social protection system. So the basic message is that if we invest in social protection, which means higher incomes for an income security for households, then we can reduce poverty and inequality. We can increase consumption and aggregate demand. We can provide better access to food and better nutrition status. We can achieve higher utilization of health services. We can facilitate a search for better jobs and riskier decision making. When people don't have money, even when there is a job in Kampala, if you don't have transport, you know how you've transported the people that you've helped to come here. They came because you could give them a ride or give them transport. A lot of people cannot afford to do that. Social protection enables that kind of mobility. But what does it mean, lead to? When you reduce poverty and inequality, you lessen social tensions and conflict. One of the reasons why there isn't a lot of conflict in the OECD countries, in the high-income countries, is because they provide for these people. 
They fight poverty as a strategic tool for social cohesion. It supposes it supports crisis response and structural change. Think about COVID-19 now. If you don't increase consumption and aggregate demand, that's what the Americans did. You know, they just gave out uh, checks for child, um, uh, it's what they call child credit support. I think more than $1,000. They are putting money in the economy because that's how they recover. We need to put money, and I'm glad that the Minister of Finance has also tried to put some money in our economy, but it's not reaching so many people because we don't have a system to deliver it. We only have a few people under the SAGE program, and so you know how we struggled even to deliver relief during the first lockdown. I think we, lost, we also struggled a little bit to uh, distribute the cash that was recently offered to urban centers. So a social protection system can help to address that. I talked about a vibrant workforce. If your people are not healthy, they can't be productive. If you're sick with malaria because you can't afford a mosquito net or you can't treat it when it's still early and you go when it's late, it's going to be extremely difficult for you to come to work. So it does affect human uh, capital development as well as educational performance. So once you've provided people with money, they can find jobs, they can have productive employment and entrepreneurship, and that's how you increase human development and productivity. We also want to take people who are from well, wealthy or health um, income sector. We are beginning to discriminate against when you fortify the vulnerable poor and give them risks. But, you know, so once you've provided people with money, they can find jobs, they can have productive employment and entrepreneurship, and that's how you increase human development and productivity, and that's how inclusive growth comes. The reason we have high levels of inequality in the world is because not everybody is able to earn a living. Economics says that you get paid what you are worth. And we all know that educated workers earn more than uneducated workers. So if most of our children are failing to make it to secondary school, they are failing to make it to P7, we can actually predict with certainty that they are going to have much lower incomes. In fact, studies show that children from poorer households earn three times less the average wage in their adults. So we are stifling our economy by three times. That's going down. Whatever growth rate it is, it goes reverses back three times. Thank you. So, I would like to talk about why it's important to invest in social protection in Uganda by sharing some statistics. I might be reminding you because you might already know them, either from you, boss, but you've also seen them from your community. All human beings in any society, and I think COVID has demonstrated this, experience risks from early childhood, through school, through youth, through working age, up to old age. In fact, disability and chronic illness, they follow us throughout life. We are always at risk, so these are much more like we cover all the different um, life cycles. So I will not go through the different risks, but you know, children are highly vulnerable because they can't take care of themselves. So if they are born in a poor family, they are more likely to be malnourished, they are more likely not to go to school, they are more likely to be unemployed as youth, they are more likely to be excluded from opportunities. Even in their working age, they are more likely to earn less income. And in old age, of course, 
they will not have contributed to NSSF because they are in the informal sector earning very low wages, and therefore it will be very difficult for them to be secure. So we all face these risks. I talked about the risks that I struggled with as a family, and I still do. We don't have health insurance. We pay a lot of money to take care of our parents. All of you do that. A social protection system can help to address some of these problems. Honorable Babadidi will know how much the SAGE grant has transformed lives in Koboko because people can take their grandchildren to school. I remember in 2012, I went to Nebi and I saw a woman, an old woman, proudly walking, showing us her cassava garden. She has the land, but she doesn't have the energy to till it. And she told us she hired young men who are also unemployed to do it. And you can imagine the multiplier effect of investments such as that. So, across the life cycle to deal with these risks, a lot of countries are opting for this poor relief safety net system, which means let's look for the poor, identify the vulnerable poor, and give them money. The reality, and I will show that statistically in the next few slides, how many people fell into poverty last year within one week? If you are working in a bar, as a waiter, as a DJ, or a manager, and they close, immediately you got unemployed. So these risks are real. When there is flooding in Teso and Karamoja, in Kasese, and it wipes out all your clothes, your, your crop, crops, you're out. And you need to have a fallback position. And for strong people who have income security, they always have even social network to deal with them. But if you don't, you're really in trouble. And this is exactly why we need to protect our human capital. Because the children in those households will not go to school. They will not have access to education, to, to, to health care. They will be malnourished. They can never achieve their productive potential. And so even when we try to target these poor people, I'll show that it's very um, hard to, to achieve. But developed countries, progressive countries, go for life cycle-based approaches. And that's what the government of Uganda has decided to do. The social protection policy is aiming for a life cycle approach to social protection. I've seen in the uh, Minister of Gender's new uh, strategic plan, they are trying to introduce a child disability grant and a disability grant over the next five years. That's progress. Because think about a family with a disabled child. The medical workers don't even know how to help. This child cannot access education. The education system doesn't even have the support that she or he needs. It's really difficult. And so basically, you're subjecting this child to a life of poverty. And this is what we see. Unemployment benefits. A lot of countries provide unemployment benefits. They provide sickness benefits. When you fall sick, that doesn't mean you should stop working. I remember a story where someone said, I'm employed in Chikuo, but when I give birth, I must go back within a few days, otherwise I'll lose my job. I know a guy who was one of the best marketers. He was working in a printing farm at Nkrumah Road. He's an Indian. He traveled to India. By the time he came back, because the lockdown caught him there, he had lost his job. Luckily, he was one of the best, so he found another job. So, unemployment insurance would have helped a guy like that. He's Ugandan, but he has family in India. And, of course, a lot of people, we all know how many people lost their jobs because of COVID-19. I own a DJ company. My boys was sitting home for a very long time. I did my best, but even I was struggling. I told you I was unemployed for a while last year. So we all need this support, even us who look strong. You are members of parliament, so you know what it means when you lose your seat, because some of you have lost it. You know, colleagues who have lost their seats, you know what that means when they lose that source of income. It's really disruptive. So having a system that cushions us, doesn't matter how rich you are, 
everybody needs that kind. Because you have to maintain the purpose of social protection is to smoothen your income. When you're working, you can save. When you're not able to, then it gives you that back in old age, when you fall sick, when you get old. And we all are vulnerable to that. And talking about disability, when it hits home, it hits hard. You know, my mother is like the most enterprising person I know. But for the last one year, she fell, got a stroke, fell again, broke her hip. She can no longer cook for herself. She can no longer heal her garden. And if she wasn't lucky to have children who have a job like me, she would still be on her bed. She wouldn't have got that operation because we didn't have health insurance. So, honorable members, health insurance, let it be a priority. You all know how difficult it is to meet those costs. So, that's the justification. We don't have a system that takes care of those life cycle risks, but we are beginning. However, as an economy, we've been slowing down. You all know that we were very vibrant in the past, in the 2000s and the 1990s. We grew really high, but recently, down quite significantly, and even poverty has increased. If you look at this graph, you can see we came from 37% of poverty headcount in 2002 to 19.7 in 2013. And then we went back. This 26.3 was because of COVID. But already we had started going up. You, you, you're hearing these messages because you're political leaders. People tell you and you see these things. The UNDP last year, in 2019, sorry, they conducted a study to assess vulnerability. They said, 55% of households in Uganda, that's 22.7 million people, were highly vulnerable to poverty in 2020, mostly because of climate shocks. And because of COVID, approximately 3.1 million people, in addition to the eight that were poor, fell into poverty. The World Bank, in its economic update of 2020, said that our growth is increasingly less inclusive because its impact on poverty reduction appears to have declined. So that's why people are complaining. The economy is still growing, but it's not pulling so many people out of poverty. Because yes, we're getting out of a very deep pit, but there is a limit to what growth or the trickle-down effect can do. It doesn't do very much unless you have a system. That's why OECD countries spend up to 30% of their GDP on social protection because that is their poverty reduction system. Inequality in Uganda and poverty. So these are the poverty trends. I just talked about them. They've been declining, but they are going up. But I wanted to talk about inequality. These are our trends. So inequality increased a bit in 2009. It reduced in 2012. And it's been on an upward trend recent. You see these things with your eyes, honorable members. And it's also uneven across our region. So you can see the inequality across regions. This gap, this gap between, so this is Eastern. It actually has the lowest level of inequality. But in the urban centers, that's where the highest levels of inequality are. And they explain some of the conflict we see on the roads. We are beginning to discriminate against each other because some of us are driving, others are walking, and we are seen as enemies. That's a threat to social cohesion. But most importantly, if I can speak as an economist, the IMF has estimated that inequality above 0 0.27 Gini coefficient hurts economic growth. because. A few people are carrying the economy. A few people are paying tax. Government is the biggest spender in Uganda, but only a few people are paying tax. So we don't have money to inject in the economy because a few people are paying tax. And that's the challenge with inequality. So we have to fix it. And social protection can be part of the solution. 
Honorable members, this is our income situation. This graphic basically shows that the vast majority of Ugandans live on very low incomes. And I would like you to have a look at this chart, honorable members. I would like your attention. If you use the international poverty line of $1.9 a day, more than 30% of people in Uganda were in poverty. That was 2016. So these are 2016 numbers. When you increase it to the threshold of 1.9, those who are above 1.9, between 1.9 and 3.2, up to 70% of Ugandans live in poverty. No wonder UBOS estimated in its statistical update of last year that between 2015 and 2019, 8.4% of households moved out of poverty, but 10 more households moved into poverty than those that came out. Because what's the difference between someone who is earning 45,000 and if that is the cutoff point for poverty, and someone who is earning 46,000? Very little. So a very small shock, and they're in poverty. So programs that po target poverty itself are not very successful, especially because our incomes are quite low. How many Ugandans? By the way, I didn't talk about the Ugandan value. So $0.8 is 2,700 shillings a day. 70% of Ugandans live on 2,700 shillings a day. Honorable members, can we achieve the middle income status unless we do something radical, because trickle-down hasn't been doing it. Yes, we've invested in energy and electricity, but only a few people can use it. So we need to get more people to use this infrastructure and multiply our effects, uh, our economy. This chart basically shows what happens between 2012 and 2014. People are always moving in and out of poverty because the incomes are quite low. So trying to target a poor person is almost a zero-sum game because people are poor today, tomorrow they are not. A large proportion of our people are vulnerable. I talked about climatic shocks. But most of this vulnerability is driven by informality also. A lot of Ugandans work in the informal sector, so they don't have secure jobs, they don't have medical insurance, they don't have access to NSSF, and of course, that's because social protection coverage is limited. Most of our people are smallholder farmers, so they are exposed to climate risks. This is a flooded heart, basically. This is a livelihood. So if you had planted beans, or whatever it was, and it flooded for days, you lost all your investment there. We have a lot of refugees, so we have so many people across the country those are refugee settlements. 1.4 million people. Um, that shows how susceptible we are to conflict. If you live on the border of South Sudan, you know what's happening to our business uh, people. It has happened in the Congo. It's happening in South Sudan. You know what has happened to Rwanda. So that's a source of risk. And I talked about Ugandans who are in the informal sector. So I want to zoom in so you can see who these people are. This chart shows that among non-wage earners, those 85% of farmers I talked about, 30% live below the poverty line. But if you double that poverty line, which is actually less than 30,000, you've got 46% of them. So add these two numbers, you can see 76% of it. And you can see how it's adding up to the statistic I showed there. So we have a high informal economy, and it's also driving this poverty, because there is no system to address this poverty head on, as developed countries or countries with social protection systems are doing. And what does this mean? It means that many households are unable to make the investments they need to make 
to build the human capital of their children. Because if your children are malnourished, if they are not healthy, if they are not educated, then they are experiencing severe and irreversible damage right from birth. And that means as adults, I already mentioned, they will earn less than people who are from well, wealthy or health, um, income secure families and their productivity is hampered. So this is exactly what drives intergenerational poverty. It is not honorable members because these poor people are lazy or drunkards. I have not seen someone who works as hard as the guys that are offloading the trucks at Kalerwe and Visega Market. You know how much they do that for? They work hard, but they are in the wrong business. So I've had a lot of people, including highly placed technical people, saying, you know, these poor people, they are very lazy. Let them go back to the village and work. They came here, first of all, because there was no productive work in the village. Everybody, I came to Kampala because I wanted a good life. And I got it. But not so many can do that, but we can help. Because the only reason I did it was because my uncle took my father to school. That was his social protection. How many kids are not in school? I'm sure a lot of our children in this room are attending online classes. How many families can afford to buy a device? That's why these countries are giving people money. Because if you don't give people money, well, you will have malnourishment, you will have perpetual poverty, and you will also have a challenge of social cohesion. Very easy to attract people who are very poor. They have nothing to lose, literally. So we need to fix this problem. I mentioned that the poverty causes irreversible damage. And this is why. Because the greatest returns on a child's development happen between zero and two years. This curve shows that progress in terms of memorizing numbers, the social skills, kids playing with others, language development, conceptualization, understanding things. You've seen kids who can't really understand things. You're talking to someone, but they, what's wrong with this person? If they don't achieve that ability before two years, they will never. And that person cannot be as productive as the people in this room. I read in the, the UN Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty, I actually meant to quote that, but I didn't get a chance to do it. He said we should stop, I'm trying to remember the word he used, but we've normalized inequality, income inequality, and we're saying, you know, these people are poor because they don't work hard. They didn't go to school. Uh, they were climbing trees and, you know, when you're a child of a family, who doesn't understand education? Your father is not educated. His father wasn't educated. There's nobody educated in the family. Who is going to push you to go to school? My father, I remember one day, he rode his bicycle and I had to run with him because he understands the, the, the purpose of education. I had a heart headache and I stayed in bed. He found me. He woke me up. He rode his bike as I ran, three kilometers. And then he was waiting for me with the headmaster and they caned me. A poor person can't do that because they probably want that child to stay home and help them with their garden. Child labor is prevalent in poor households. None of our children does engages in child labor. I'm about to wind this down. I already made this point. This is called the Heckman curve. I already made the point. The best returns on children investment happen when they are young. So the point about this is that we need to invest in prenatal and early childhood investments and social protection can actually do that because that's what gives us the greatest return. Honorable members, this is a picture from the cover of the NDP3. This is our Bombardier, I believe. I've seen beautiful pictures of factories, nice roads and trains. If we don't invest in a healthy, educated, and dynamic workforce and citizenry, all these investments in infrastructure are likely to generate limited returns. I already made that point earlier. 
Therefore, the point I'm making is let's invest in human capital through social protection, get a healthier citizenry, build an educated and adaptable workforce which can use the technology such as I am, who can, you know, build applications online and do things, be able to learn online so that we can contribute to a more dynamic economy which enables more people to work in better jobs, open businesses, increase consumption, and that's how we become resilient in the face of shocks and have better access to financial services. And if we do that, we contribute to a more stable, cohesive, and dignified society. That's what it means to be a middle-income country. When you're stable, you're cohesive, everybody can see that they are benefiting from growth and also contributing. Now, Uganda, as a country, has made a lot of progress in that direction because, as I mentioned, as Patrick introduced me, between 2010, the Minister of Gender was implementing the Expanding Social Protection Program and this program was aimed at embedding a social protection system. So through this program, I already mentioned it, they developed a policy. They've laid a very strong foundation. And these are opportunities for us to reduce this vulnerability and build our human capital through social protection. So you know about SAGE. I will not talk about it because it's in every district. If you're from northern Uganda and some parts of western Uganda central, you know about NUSAF and Dr. Deep. But there are other programs. The government is actually working on a cash for work program for urban workers, standard design. There is a child sensitive program in West Nile implemented by World Food Program. Save the Children is actually implementing part of that, and we are also designing other programs uh, in other countries. We have started discussions on a shock responsive social protection system with development partners, and these are all important. Honorable members, I want to thank you for this. This chart shows how government's contribution to the SAGE program increased between 2014 and 15 and 2019. In 2014, SAGE's budget was only 9 billion. Today, I think, Patrick, correct me, Honorable Flavia, I think it's 107 billion. 107 from nine so this is progress you need to give your hands a clap because this is a major milestone that i can account i can um, uh, say this is the outcome of your work as members of parliament especially with support from the parliamentary forum the ministry of gender has increased the value of the special grant for people with disabilities and i already mentioned they are contemplating a disability and child grant a lot of capacity has been built to deliver SAGE, which is, by the way, one of the most trusted programs of government because they invested in systems that manage judiciary risk. They reach people. Remember, they were using mobile money. Nobody touches those people's money. It goes direct to the beneficiary. But to do that, you need a system, and they built it. It's also available in NUSAF. They have so many things they've done that we can build on to have this life set cycle social protection system. We've got funding from the government of Uganda I talked about and our partners. But it's still a drop in the ocean. If you look at social protection spending, and this includes pensions, so this is money that's spent on SAGE, NUSAF, uh, some food for assets and all different labor intensive public works programs but nssf and the public service pension scheme they are the ones so what you see here as uh, 0 0.6 percent of gdp most of that is nssf money and the public service pension schemes that's less than two million people the majority of our people are not benefiting and this is the point uh, I was making. Spending on direct income support is still less than 1% of GDP. Spending so little, only about 0.7%, 0.8% of GDP on social protection. Of course, you're very familiar with this picture. This shows our spending priorities as a country. 
We spend more, almost 20% on works and transport. These are up to 2019. These are from the budget framework paper. We spend 11% on security, 10% on education, 8 on health, 3 on agriculture, 0 0.7 on social development. And this is our people, literally, the majority of our people. So there's some homework for us to do there. This chart is basically to show that Uganda is almost negligible in terms of social spending compared to other countries. Lesotho is here. It's among the biggest spending, more than 2% of GDP. Kenya is spending something, uh, I think, slightly higher than us of GDP. Tanzania also slightly. So Uganda, even among the peers, is spending much less on social protection. And that's not very good. I mentioned that the government of Uganda is forward-looking. So we have an opportunity to develop a long-term strategy which is under development now. And I would like to interest you, honorable members, to challenge the Minister of Gender to involve you in this process because we need to define our future together. This is not about the policymaker and the Minister of Gender. It's about every Ugandan participating in this process because we are defining the future for everybody across the life cycle. And so basically what this is saying is the different types of programs that we can invest in by 2030. They already started on these two, child disability benefit and adult disability benefit. But we can actually reform NSSF to offer family package, not just people taking their money out. Because once you take out the money now, 20%, Sorry to bust some people's bubble, because I have a lot of money in SSF. But I know that if that happens, the young people won't be able to get a family package. If you follow social insurance principles, you can achieve more with that money. But if you take it out as a lump sum, you're not able to do that. And that's some of the pain I have about the reforms at NSSF. But I understand because there is no alternative, so we need to be thinking about alternatives. This I will skip. This is basically the cost of the vision which I showed you. If we can do all these things, we can spend just about 1.5% of GDP. It can be done because this is how you build a very cohesive society. I talked about shock response. Basically, shock response is about adopting the regular social protection system to deliver assistance whenever there is a shock such as COVID or a drought or a crisis such as war. And we are having discussions in the Ministry of Gender and other stakeholders to build a system uh, that can address to that. Under NUSAF, they have experimented with a disaster risk financing facility. And when there was drought in Karamoja, they saved a lot of money because people didn't have to sell their assets and things like that. So this is important. This chart basically is telling the story between 2014 when we had Sage and a few others, but now there are so many programs. We have a policy, we have a single registry which can build on to register people, more government funding, uh, and there is a long-term strategy under development. So we are on the right track, but we still have a lot of work to do. I already talked about what these benefits are. We can use social protection to build a higher income and secure nation through investing in our people's health, education, and social cohesion. These messages, I shouldn't belabor them, but they're important. I'll sh share these slides with you. Our incomes are very volatile have a level of vulnerability to shocks that's comparable to none in the region. So that's why the vast of our population keep falling in poverty. But we can support them to manage these shocks and build their human capital. We've laid a good foundation, but as I said, further investment is required and we can count on you, honorable members, to shift the needle. That's in DJ speak. When you want to play another song, you shift the needle to something, the next song. So we are counting on you to shift the needle so we can 
cover more people with the social protection system, give a comprehensive uh, list of social protection benefits. I thank you very much. We are very keen to support and save the children, prioritize investments in children. We want governments all over the world to progressively move towards universal coverage of social protection. We know it takes time, but that is where we want to be going. If we have a long-term vision that's clear, we can actually lay a very good foundation for building this system. I thank you very much for your attention. Okay, thank you, David, for a very wonderful and elaborate uh, presentation. And like he said, we are going to share the same uh, with you so that you can be able to read at leisure. But also, at the same time, this is one of the series of engagements that we are planning. So some of the things that may not be clear will be clarified as we move along. But I wanted to introduce the members of parliament who just joined us. My friend, Honorable Paul Akamba, thanks for coming. You can wave or stand up. Yes, uh, Honorable Cyrus Algon. Yes, uh, Honorable Cyrus Algon is the member of the Uganda Parliamentary Reform Social Protection Board. And then Honorable Arepe Moses. Thank you for coming. Is there anyone I've forgotten? Yes, Honorable Catherine and Mira, my member of parliament from Kabare. And uh, she's the member of the executive of the Uganda Parliamentary Reform on Social Protection. And, okay. I, microphone, please. I have to admit that I, I'm not very familiar with your name, so. So as we wait uh, for that introduction, so introductions are very important because even among us members of parliament, I know uh, it's been a long process of uh, getting to know one another and each other, so it's very important that uh, we do that. Morning, morning honorable members. Boys Asawako, MP Budaka Constituency. Okay, thank you very much and thank you for coming. Now, uh, uh, morning members and organizers. I'm Yakatwanda Abdu, I represent workers of the country. Pleasure. I think all of us have been introduced, all have introduced ourselves. All right. So we are almost coming to the end. Uh, of this uh, program, I was meant to make a presentation on the role of members of parliament in the social uh, protection debate or engagement. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to simply summarize what I think are critical, modeled around uh, the key uh, functions that attach the office of the member of parliament. And one of them is legislation. Social protection interventions are very key. And in many cases, uh, governments have gone ahead and embedded some of the key provisions uh, in the social protection sector into law. And uh, you are doing some of that work through the NSSF bill already. But there could be some more laws that we could explore around social care. In Kenya, for example, and in the Republic of South Africa, they have a law relating to social assistance, the provision to children, to older persons and people with disabilities. It is something that uh, government should look at, and it is something that members of parliament could support. The other core function of parliament, of course, is budgeting. And as you have heard, at the inception of SEDGE, there were, there were limited funds. I remember in, 2000, in 2012, Government was struggling to 
to provide $2 billion at the time as counterpart funding. But along the way, and through your work and a lot of advocacy, at least we are now at $107 billion, which I think is very impressive. So, but you hear this song, in and out, especially in your committees, about a limited financing for SAGE and for other social protection interventions. You will hear that even when Parliament appropriates these funds along the way, the release does not match with the expectations in the approved budget. So that would also be another area of continuous engagement, and, and, and that is precisely your role. The other one is oversight. Oversight is very important. It is not just enough to appropriate resources for key government programs, but it is also very important that you go to the field, that you go to the program areas and see how they are performing. And the Uganda Parliamentary Reform and Social Protection does offer opportunities for going to the field to see how these government programs that you appropriate money for are doing. The other one is representing constituents' interests, and I think that is equally very important. You have opportunities for matters of national importance. These could be matters in your constituents relating to how some of these social protection programs are being implemented and asking very specific questions relating to financing, relating to program implementation, and this you could take advantage of. And of course, questions or questions for answers, the Prime Minister, question time, those would be very important uh, in your role as MP, ensure that matters that relate to our people, the older person, the children, the women, the youth, and others are kept uh, high on the agenda. So that's the bit of the role of members of parliament regarding advancement of social protection to our citizens. And on that note, I want to hand over to Honorable Chibadia to lead us in the question and answer session that we shall give about 20 minutes. And then I will ask uh, uh, the Honorable Flavia Kabahenda to close uh, this engagement. So, Honorable Shibadia, please. Thank you, thank you, Doctor. It's a, it's a pleasure that we have the representatives of the two sensitive committees, and uh, uh, Flavia can bear witness the battle that we had in the last parliament. I at least we tried to provide some fruits, and I think in this parliament we shall not have anybody to blame. And we shall not have any reason to transfer any responsibility to any other team if we don't fulfill what the aims and objectives of social protection are. So it's time for discussion. I only need to thank the panelists. I need to thank the, presenta the, the presenters. Those presentations have been so good. Mr. Katabaz is still with us everywhere. You will always find him. He's a, he's a, he's a very, very useful and resourceful as far as this program is concerned. We are opening, but what is key, as they presented, the issue of budgeting, we need to, as we present and as we react, we need to really focus on that line and you see how best, because I know the budget committee, even if there was a, a failure somewhere in the ministerial policy statement, or somewhere when the gender is trying and something is failing, budget committee has powers to do something and make sure we, we move where we are so that it finds others who are not on the budget committee in the house to legislate and make sure we are there. So this time let us make it a point that this parliament must not transfer any responsibility to any other parliament that has to come in. We must fulfill what we are supposed to fulfill we must achieve 100% of the objectives of social protection. Yes, Doctor. Thank you. It's not working. Okay, it's okay, I think, right? Yeah. Uh, I want to thank the previous uh, presenter. First of all, I'm Patrick, Dr. Patrick Mutono. I represent uh, people of Butebo. Butebo district is one constituency, and uh, we broke off from Palisa. We're in eastern Uganda.
Uh, thank you very much for this forum on uh, social protection. I am uh, personally impressed. This is the first time I attend the meeting on the forum of the issues that you have uh, highlighted, uh, which are very, very, very crucial for the future of any country, more so for this third world country like Uganda. Now, there are many facets which I've had uh, regarding social protection. I want to limit my, myself to one, which is uh, nutrition. Um, I'll, I'll leave the others, but let me limit myself to the issue of nutrition, which you have brought out eloquently. You brought out the issue of stunted children, talked about 29%. Uh, you brought about the effects of being stunted, uh, poor physical growth, of course, poor production, poor cognitive uh, development, and a lot of, a lot of, uh, of things which eventually are a national problem in terms of managing uh, that population which didn't come, uh, which didn't develop well. Now, I'm, I may be wrong, but I've not had um, a clear national policy on nutrition, especially, of uh, our children. Now, I want to compare uh, nutrition of our children. I'm not a farmer, but there's other people who farm both crops and animals. When they plant, they make sure they're planting at the right time. There must be rain or they will uh, irrigate. And they have to, sometimes if they think their soil is poor, they have to include some fertilizer. And of course, they're always happy to see the development uh, of that maize farm or whatever. So I'm wondering, our children, if it was like a maize farm, what would that look like? I probably think they'll be short and pink and some of them getting maize or some of them nothing. So definitely the owner of that farm may not be happy about that garden. Now, somehow we gloss over issues of nutrition. Uh, the researchers have noted that uh, especially brain development starts as conception and by two, three years, it's at maximum. And five, four, five, it's almost done. There's another spot later at uh, adolescence, but the crucial ones are conception to three to three years. Now, I have not heard anything about antenatal care in our presentation. Maybe, maybe I, I didn't hear anything. But uh, um, we, our mothers, especially in the rural areas, we emphasize a lot about going to the clinics and natal care, and that's okay. But we don't talk about the nutrition because that baby that is developing, nutrition is so critical. Because by the time they are born, the brain already taken a certain trend, depending on uh, what the mothers fed on. And if we don't do something, we already, we have already lost time. And then on top of that, by the time, during that child, early childhood time, there was time a program that came out, early childhood nutrition. But I don't know what happened to it. I don't hear about it anymore. Now, as I mentioned earlier, I'm a doctor. I have, uh, for the last 20 years, I've managed uh, my own hospital in the village. And uh, when I started it, I was confronted with uh, an issue of nutrition. Now, that's the severe type. That is, the, we usually call it kwasha called protein energy malnutrition, where kids have pink hair, they are bloated, they are, you know, they, they, they are not happy, they just... So I was confronted with those issues, and as one, I wondered what to do. So I, I tried to do some little research, briefly. And... Uh, I went back to the basics. 
what is wrong with these kids? These kids are lacking protein and energy. Uh, and where does that protein come from? And where does that food come from? Usually when we were in school, they showed us a, a food pyramid. I think we, we are also, all, all have heard of a food pyramid. Where at the bottom we have cereals and rice and millet and starch producing food, energy. Then the next level we have greens and fruits. Then the next level we have protein. As the pyramid goes smaller, then at the top we have fat. Now, I write, okay, in our villages, as mothers come, I want to find out whether we have all these things in our setup. Incidentally, we have everything and even more. We have millet, we have rice, we have potatoes, we have beans, we have groundnuts, uh, we have eggs. And as you go up the food pyramid, we have anything. So I found, I tried to find out now what is the problem. I zeroed down on not money, but knowledge of our population in terms of uh, nutrition, of feeding the kids. Feeding a child is different from feeding an adult. Uh, just like people with the farms, they know exactly which pesticide, which uh, fertilizer to plant with your maize. They are aware of that. At least they are even ahead in terms of taking care of such things. But with our children, they are totally not aware. They have our cultural norms, which uh, sometimes may not help in terms of nutrition of the children. So I started interviewing the mothers, whether, you know, because to a baby to grow, tissues have to expand. And you need protein. Bones, you need protein and calcium. Uh, you need a lot of uh, vitamins and uh, el so many elements. You need iron. Without iron, they get, get anemic. So a lot of those things come in, and the children are coming to hospital. And yet we have in our villages all that, all that stuff. So we, I did a small research. I picked 100 uh, family mothers with purely malnourished children. So we decided to, okay, two, two seconds, to, to sort of teach them about the, about the foods that we have. One of the things we decided, okay, get one chicken. That chicken should be laying one egg a day, and that egg you give to your what? The rest of the chickens, you can do whatever, you know, sell. And uh, issues of granite. I, I, I realized that over, over those 100, over 80%, the malnutrition reversed just because of pure knowledge. And the mothers were really shocked that it was all about what? All about knowledge. So we, we need to uh, expand this issue of uh, social protection in terms of nutrition. And all starting from uh, antenatal care. So uh, 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 maybe as you answer a question, I would like to hear what co coherent policy is there to address uh, this problem as regards of uh, our population. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Colleagues, we have 15 minutes to close this discussion. So let's be mindful of time. You use one minute, straight to the point. I could not stop Dr. because we entered, we, we brought a topic where he is specialized, but <laughs> just one minute and we move. Uh, thank you very much, um, Mr. Chairman. And uh, Lambert, for your fantastic presentation. It's also my first time to attend this. I think I've been emboldened and provided a great uh, knowledge. Um, maybe three comments. One is your measure of child vulnerability or uh, uh, social uh, vulnerability. You talked about cash only. In Africa, very few people are in the money economy. We look at other aspects like food in the homes. Would you be able to extend your, um, uh, your tools to include food as well? The second one is uh, you have identified 
the vulnerable, group, uh, vulnerable groups that needs uh, social protection very well. And one of them is actually the elders under stage. We have been very successful with that. When I was campaigning, I realized that you limited the numbers, the age group to about what? 80. These people are dying now at 80. So why don't we reduce the age to 60 and then expand that as parliament, as budget committee, I'm a member of budget committee, will be willing to give more money so that you broaden stage, make one project that you've taken very successful. It's already successful, broaden that so that we see it. And of course, the other aspect is you've talked about the, our funding uh, to social security, uh, being social protection, being still less than 1%, 0.7%. So come up with appropriate policies to cover some of the vulnerable groups so that as parliament we can continue to appropriate enough money uh, so that maybe as um, social protection as a percentage of GDP can go to 2% or more. I would recommend for you to do that. Um, then you've not talked about child labor, child protection. There are very many kids there who are being abused. Maybe we need policies around that as well. And um, of course, finally, I have so many to say, but we don't have time. One of the things that uh, Dr. Mutoro talked about, which is around food, Malawi made it compulsory. I was in Malawi for three years. I was a banking executive there. Malawi made it show that every family, if you are a family of four or five, each person must have four bags of maize attributed to one member of the family. So. If you're five in a family, you must have uh, 20 bags for kawunga as, 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 uh, uh, as a matter of food security. Why don't we come with ap appropriate policies to make sure that our children have food? Uh, and uh, during colonial days and post-colonial period, the British made it compulsory for our parents to produce, to at least have two gardens of cotton. It was a must. And we also make something so that fathers and mothers are forced to make sure there is food for the children. I thank you. Uh, thank you, Honorable Chair and colleagues. Uh, I think uh, I want to thank the presenters. But Honorable colleagues, I, I recommend a paradigm shift where we should move away from uh, the boardrooms to the ground. Uh, why I'm saying this, when we are measuring the Human Development Index, we are talking about quality of life, we are talking of uh, life expectancy, but I think down, like the presenter David said, I travel from Kampala to Arua, but what tickles my mind is how many vehicles are carrying cargo, how many vehicles are carrying produce. When I'm traveling from here to Busia, you find that I think that's what we need to do. What I'm saying here is that, one, the boardroom should be for strategy. We identify the strategy like we are here. What are the policy gaps? And after all, we are here to legislate. Tell us what are those key constraining variables in terms of policy so that we can take on them. But uh, suffice to mention, we should really move and ensure that uh, we are role models. Let's lead by example. A case in point, I think Chairman has visited me, uh, Honorable Kibaria. What, we, what I do is to ensure that at least, as a, as a legislator, I should be in the garden and the, this, this, this business should actually see. I should ensure that at least I'm the source of uh, input. If they are talking of mangoes, I should actually give them. Then actually, when we do this, if they are talking of popper, I should be able to raise for them. If you are talking of fingerlings, I should be able to raise for them. So that at least they have access. You see, when we went for when we wait for government programs, I think we shall not be able to to catch up. But if you had to bridge this gap of nutrition, income enhancement, I think that's what we need to do. And Mr. Chairman and colleagues, we should we should we should actually be role models, have what to show so that at least the population can copy. When we do that, I think we shall achieve it in the shortest time possible. I thank you.
Uh, the first issue has been raised, it, wa it was about lowering the age limit, which I won't again talk about it. Uh, Mr. David talked about, uh, he informed us that poverty causes irreversible damage. And currently, we have been affected by COVID, whereby most young girls have got unwanted pregnancies. And this one means that it's going to lead them to hate their children and they won't take good care of them. And this is the time when these young children need exclusive breastfeeding and care so that they can develop very well. I, I foresee a need for us to focus on advocating for psychosocial support for these young girls so that they are able to accept their children because I can imagine most of them, the fathers are not there. It's the grandparents who could be there, even who are not able to take care of them. So if we do not focus on these young girls, we may end up getting a very big problem in future. So I pray that as we legislate, let us legislate in that line. Thank you. Uh, encourage members to st state their names so that the presenter can be able to capture them. I'm called Irene Linda, woman MP for Porto. Uh, thank you, moderator. Dr. Asime Florence Akiki, woman MP, Masindi District, commonly known as the Dancing Queen. I'm here with the, the, the artist also. Anyway, Sage, I'm on Sage. I wanted to see in the presentation uh, how, uh, how we are faring. I've heard that actually this program is highly funded by, by the development partners. And government, my government, is supposed to contribute a certain percentage. Uh, how sustainable is this program? And I, I hear that the partners are so, uh, will soon pull out. Uh, what is... How sustainable is this program when the donors pull out? It's good the budget committee is here. We are having a lot of cutting in, in the budget. So uh, we need to devise ways on how we are going to actually sustain SEGE amidst the withdrawal of the, the funders. Uh, how can we uh, include this program in the parish model? Uh, that is going to be implemented by our government. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. That's my name, Silas Aukon, MP Kumi Municipality Independent. One, I'd love to appreciate the chairperson of the forum. Thank you for the great job. And uh, colleagues, you'll allow me to thank Honorable Flavia for having sustained this forum properly. She has understood it, and that's why it's moving on well. To move us from 7 billion or so to 107 via government releases is not a joke. It's not a joke. So for me, I don't want to take it for granted. Any serious forum needs serious leadership. And I think that's where we need to start. In the 11th parliament, we must sustain serious leadership. Allow me to applaud the technocrats, Patrick and David. Thanks a lot for the insights. You have done such a great job. My feeling is that I do not have enough time to speak on the way forward. So if you can allow, allow me to say something now. One, the presenter, David, talked about the healthcare disabilities, early childhood, sicknesses, unemployment, and so on. I have a feeling that we need to reconverge beyond this meeting so that we study these aspects in detail and we extract the challenges. And that should be able to drive us towards our legislative agenda for the 11th parliament. I say so because I have a feeling that's where 
the whole thing lies. In terms of motions that we want to present on parliament, in parliament, what is that special motion that we want to bring on board? Petitions. If we are asking questions on what? If it's the issue of budgeting, where are the champions? That drives me to ask from the, from the convergence here, how many members so far have registered with this forum? I say so because we need the champions. Those champions are the ones to stand for us. They are the ones to move the motions. They are the ones to help on issues of petitions. They are the ones to ask the technical questions on the floor. They are also the ones to ask questions during the Prime Minister's question time. So it is my feeling that it is only very important we now build our team by having members registered officially and we start from there. So that, Chair, we maintain a team that will get to understand social protection properly. Moreover, there is an issue here. Yes, government recently helped people with the money, 100,000, the Nabanja money. But I can tell you, we do not have a mature social protection mechanism established by government, of which I feel we need to move a motion on the floor of parliament, urging government to do that exactly. Not only on issues of sage, but for the rest. I want to thank you. And uh, Chair, if you allow, we need another meeting urgently. Identify the challenges, identify our legislative agenda, take it to the office of the speaker so that they know what we're about to do, what we're going to do, what we want to do, and what should be done by us. Thank you so much for God and my country. Yeah, thank you very much, Chair and the colleagues. I want to thank the presenter and the, the, issue of, uh, the issue we are talking about. I want to bring out the cross-cutting issue, but because the budget committee is here and also the forum is concerned with social protection, then we can talk about it. In the presentation, uh, Mr. Moesige, if I'm not mistaken, David talked about, uh, said that if we don't invest in human capital, if we don't invest in education, we shall miss out on the, the human capital. But when we talk about it and all of us are here, maybe we need also to lobby others, we should look at our children, uh, the SEG, at least say, can parent, uh, the elderly can get the 20,000, but when you look at the education, we have a budget of uh, the grant of 10,000 per child in primary per year. So that, is, that means about 3,000 per term, colleagues. Don't you think we need to sound a bell or to bring out our voice so that that money can be increased? Can a child work on, I mean, use 3,000 a year? Because we know how much as legislators, we know the value of money. And when we talk about it, we know the effect. If you had 10,000, it's like you don't have anything. Even your voters, some of them, like mine, 10,000, you cannot give them 10,000. So we should, we should think through if we are advocating for these people or for everybody because we want a better future. I thank you. Thank you, Chair. And thank you so much, David. I liked it when uh, you talked about uh, child poverty. And uh, given your experience, the global experience in issues to do with child poverty, I wanted you to share with us two or three things that you think our country, Uganda, can do to match with other countries elsewhere that have addressed the issue of child poverty. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. 
I'm called Take Joy Wako representing old persons. I'm sorry I came in late, but I've heard you mentioning something about sage, and my interest is on sage. First of all, I don't know whether my points have been covered, but all the same, let me repeat them in case they have been covered. Now, when Nira was registering for the first time, mobilization was very poor. People didn't understand why they were being registered, especially the old people. Many of them missed out, and those who registered didn't give their exact years. And now when this program of SAGE came in, many of them have missed out. They are already 80 years plus, but they registered less years. Now they cannot meet or get that small allowance the government is giving out. So there is a lot of outcry in the villages there. And many of them keep ringing us, see how we can assist them. Then another thing on SAGE, this eight years plus, when you go to see, there are very few now people who are in eight years who can benefit from this fund. The majority are less. And those who can benefit who are eight years, many of them are very sickly and they cannot reach the paying points. Yet, when these people are going out to pay, they are strictly told that somebody must come in person and sign for himself or herself. So many of them miss out because even if they are 80, they cannot reach the paying points. Another thing is this, the 20,000 the government is paying out. Surely, compare the 20,000 with the living standards of our country today. What can the 20,000 do? One has to hire a bike, a border border, take him to the paying station, and the border border man wants 20,000, yet he's going to get 20,000. I think that one also should be cons considered. I was of the view, I hope we shall succeed if the age can be brought down. If they cannot put it back at 60, at least let it be 65 or 70, so that many of our old people can also enjoy the fruits of their country. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, honorable members. Um, I will respond to uh, competent to answer the financing issues. A few months ago, I would have been uh, on the phone to my boss or the PS asking how much money is there. I, I don't know the actual numbers, but I'm sure Patrick is quite engaged with that. So he will answer the questions about SAGE uh, financing and uh, access. But these are actually fundamental issues. So let me start from the beginning um, by appreciating the brilliant comments and um, explanation from Dr. Patrick Mutoro, Honorable. You did a very good job to amplify the message on nutrition because, you know, it's the foundation of life, right, from conception. So I agree with you. It's something we must do. And I wanted to respond to your point about the issue of knowledge. Save the Children globally is now renowned for its cash plus approach. We believe that cash, and this has been um, um, researched, there's a lot of evidence, basically I'm sure that's part of the study, that evidence includes the study you, you, you did, that cash is more effective if it's complemented with behavioral change communication. So, in fact, the program I talked about, the Child Sensitive Social Protection Program in West Nile, which is implemented by WFP, is recruiting Save the Children to manage the behavioral change communication component. And we are doing this all over the world. It's kind of our uh, flagship entry point. Because, in fact, 
child sensitivity is also defined as enhancing the nutritional aspects of our social protection programming. You wanted to know about the policy. I did not talk about UNAP2, the Uganda National Action Plan on Nutrition. It's recently been approved by the Prime Minister, I believe sometime in June, and it does actually provide for a framework uh, for how the country can enhance nutrition. And social protection, of course, is one of the tools. There are several other. I think nutrition has been mainstream because I also know there is a national nutrition policy, but also there is a national early childhood development, uh, I think, action plan. I did mention, but because of time, I didn't um, explain it a lot. Most of that information is available. I'll be happy to share it. Honorable member, you did not mention your name, but Honorable Omara, you wanted to know whether cash or cash and food. Cash is king. The evidence we've seen globally suggests that if you give people money, they will buy food. So from a social protection point of view, you give them cash. But food security doesn't come from cash alone. Food security comes from agriculture uh, production because you also need to be able to guarantee supply. So cash gives you access, but you have to have supply of food. So families also need to be food secure in addition to being income secure. So it's a combination of both, but there's a very clear niche for social protection in terms of uh, smoothening income security. Of course, if you live in the urban centers, it's really cash. Now, the question is, should you distribute food or cash? WFP, Save the Children, all the global humanitarian agencies are now moving to cash because it's faster to deliver. People decide what to use it for. Even vouchers, you know, they are not necessary. Like, there's no evidence that um, they would make a big difference. So unless you're controlling for um, specific things like inflation, cash is sufficient. Uh, but of course, it, it's context specific. I love the idea that you can reduce the age of, of, of SCG eligibility because our child sensitive assessment, which we, we, we are launching, by the way, and uh, here's an invitation. On the 19th of uh, November, we are going to launch a child sensitivity analysis report that we conducted at Save the Children together with the Ministry of Gender, Labor and Social Development. And one of the recommendations is that you should reduce the age of the SCG, the Senior Assistance Grant or SAGE, because if you do that, you reach more people. And we know that the most vulnerable children live in these older persons' households. We also know that it will take time to have a child benefit. But in the meantime, we can make swifter progress. It's a low-hanging fruit, would achieve a lot, would help with the recovery, it would help a lot of old people who have extra costs now because of the restrictions imposed by COVID. It's harder to go to hospitals. So reducing that would really be a powerful thing and empowering for these people. The policies are there. We just need to implement them. I like your idea of expanding coverage, uh, spending to 2% of GDP. The Ministry of Gender's vision aims for 1.5. We actually don't need to spend 2%. 1.5 is enough to cover in a, gra in a gradual way. The, part, the point is start now with a few, like child disability grant, which they've said they want to do. Do a disability grant, but move to covering more children and enhancing the child sensitivity of the program. Child labor. Uh, there was a question about uh, child labor. I did not talk about it, but of course, Social protection helps to address child labor. It's one of the most researched areas. It's one of the most documented impacts of cash that it reduces child labor because then parents don't need to use their children to earn an extra income, especially in times of crisis. Um, in fact, you talked about your work in Malawi. The first social protection scheme I heard of that was researched in Africa was called the Michinji Cash Transfer Pilot in Malawi. And of course, they also save is working in Malawi. In fact, my colleague has just moved there. Food security is important to them. Honorable Yakatonda, you're absolutely spot on 
We need to lead by example. There are so many good programs on food security and livelihoods enhancement, but the point of social protection is that it enables people to access, it grants access. The purpose of social protection is to reduce the demand side barriers, the demand side constraints to access, either to food or nutrition or to health services, including uh, maternal, because someone talked about um, uh, antenatal care. There are costs associated with accessing these services. So if we can combine cash plus with antenatal care, absolutely, that's how we, we will lead to um, uh, better human capital. And I think I can combine that with the point that Honorable Rav Sheja uh, Margaret raised. Yes, we need to enhance this funding for education because I showed you it's one of the lowest. We spend more on security than education. So absolutely a very important point. These choices are not binary. We have to get the right combination. In economics, it's called optimization. You know, when you have um, 100,000, you need to decide what to put on your car and water. You don't say, I only have four your car. You have to balance, and that's what we need to do with our budget. Uh, Honorable uh, Linda, yes, psychosocial support is important. In fact, Uganda's policy acknowledges social care services. The Minister of Gender, I'm aware, has developed a social care uh, framework which defines the scope of work that needs to be done here. They are working on a social, um, social care workforce uh, strategy with development partners. So once this strategy I talked about is ready, I think we'll be able to invest significantly in this. Honorable uh, Asimwe Florence, um, you raise an important point, but I want to assure you, the graph I showed was showing that government funding, if I can go back, in 2011, government was contributing 500 million shillings to the program, while donors were providing so much more, when Saj was still a pilot. Now, government, I think, is spending more than 80% of the cost of the SAGE program. So that's a lot of progress. That's why I wanted you, honorable members, to clap for yourselves. Because in the region, only I think Kenya has done that. So we are really trailblazers in that area. So SAGE is actually sustainability, is sustainable. We can do these things. We've built Entebbe Expressway. We've built the Ginger Bridge. We've built Karuma Dam. We've, there's nothing we can't do if we have the political will to do it. It can be done. We can make this country a better place. Thank you so much, Honorable Aogon. I know you're a champion. That's what's needed. I told you, beyond my family, this is my purpose. And if you can join us, we can make this country different. I can tell you, it's not just hard work. That's what the special rapporteur on poverty was saying. We should stop you know, stigmatizing people and saying, you know, poor people, do, they work the hardest. But if we help people invest in their children, education, nutrition, access to health, then they will be able to do all the things we want them to do. Um, Honorable Joy, Joy Wakol, um, you are asking about access to pay points. Yes, that's an important point. I'm sure Patrick can respond to that, as well as the value of the SCG. The last time I checked, I think the SAGE had already lost more than 50% of its value because 25% is where we started at 22,000 in 2011. It was increased, I believe, in 2013 and it's stagnated since then. But of course, we were trying to reach more people. Now we've reached more people. We know the value of these investments. We have a crisis. We can use this program as part of the recovery. So I totally support you on enhancing the value of the grant, on uh, guaranteeing access, because it's a right uh, of these people. And um, absolutely, these are the things we need to be doing. I think I did not answer, I think I answered Honorable Vyaka Tonda. Um, I think that's all I wanted to comment about. So 
Thank you very much, honorable members, for this opportunity. We are counting on you to change Uganda's course. We can become a middle income country if we invest in our children and our people. Thank you. Yes, I, most of the questions, I think David has answered them. Um, I want to make a few comments on SEGE. Yes, SEGE has been a very hot topic uh, in Parliament on the account that we started uh, from a very difficult situation where government was uh, struggling to meet its counterpart obligations in 2012. But then, as you have heard, uh, this has improved to 107 uh, billion and about uh, 32 billion less of what ordinarily would be the ultimate requirement. And that's an area for continuous uh, engagement because even when you have a balance of about 30, 32, 38 billion, once it is not provided, it means that there are some districts that may delay. Uh, to get payments. You have heard of scenarios where several months pass uh, uh, when older persons have not received their money. So it is an area that the Committee on Gender needs to be very firm on, and of course working with the Committee on Budget, to see that for the budgetary requests that are made uh, in respect of the, the current implementation plan, that the same be provided as they are. Because in any case, this money is going straight uh, to the older person. The sustainability question, I think, is in part being answered because, as it is right now, financing for SEGE is purely government of Uganda. Uh, the donors have uh, phased out their contribution, and it is government of Uganda that um, uh, is, is financing all that. And, and we still think uh, the commitment so far to provide 107 reflects the commitment, but also the fact that within Uganda's budgetary means, this is uh, sustainable. We just need uh, to put in some little bit of effort. The challenges brought forth by NIRA are very evident uh, to everybody, but also more painful for older persons, because at least for them, you need a national ID in order to access a payment. Some of us have issues with our NIRA cards, but because there is no urgent requirement to produce it for a benefit, maybe it is not as serious as it is for older persons. And that's where NIRA uh, needs to be, uh, to be called upon to ensure that there is a specific intervention targeting older persons. Because if the NIRA records are not very clear for older persons, it limits uh, enrollment on the program at, at various levels. There are those who are eligible today, there are those who are eligible tomorrow. So if the system is not very clear, then this whole program on stage might be thrown into paralysis. So it is something that uh, Honorable Chair, Committee on Gender and Development, it is a matter that you need to uh, take on very seriously uh, so that we see together, working together, advocating uh, to see that this is uh, uh, resolved as soon as possible. And I would, of course, encourage uh, MPs representing older persons to work very closely with us so that we amplify advocacy regarding this issue. On the issue of the value of the grant, as David has indicated, it started at 22,000. There was an adjustment that was made 25. And in last year's modeling, we had recommended, as, as part of the last Parliament's advocacy, we had recommended a revision to 30,000. I know that is certainly not also very, very sufficient, but we need to see progression taking into account inflation, inflation movement and many, other and many other considerations that are taking place. So it is something that, again, we need also drum up support in terms of advocacy, ensure that at least this goes up to 30,000 in our initial modeling of last financial year. So it is something that we can uh, debate on. Uh, only Omar talked about the issue of food. I, I want to supplement what David was saying. I also wanted to say that we have community-based social protection mechanisms where members of the community, members of the wider family make contributions 
So in essence, we would need to value them and also attach a value in our calculation of the social protection interventions that we have. The challenge that we see with our community approaches is that over time, our, community, our, commun our social structure has broken down because of the rural urban migration that is happening, uh, because of the many challenges that we are seeing in our communities. So people are focusing more on their own as individuals rather than the community the, the way it used to be. So that's why you see that you have many older persons being abandoned as children go to, go to towns. And in fact, by the way, giving them a burden of having children mothered or fathered in the cities and then sending them back to older persons without any means of additional support. So our social structure has somewhat broken down because of the economic challenges that we are seeing, but then also because of the influences that are attributed to our participation in the global market. So, 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 so that's why it is important that is recorded, but our future for social protection for the vulnerable lies more on systems that we need to put in place that do not rely heavily on the goodwill of people, but rather on the issue of guaranteeing a right uh, to our members of the community. So I think I thought I could respond to that. We are still together. The last possibly I would uh, comment on uh, uh, Honorable Silas. We would welcome members of parliament to join the forum. There are forms at the exit on the table, enlist and become uh, part of the of us. There are many capacity building programs that have been lined up and there are also some field visits that are being lined up between now and, and December and we, would, we think those would provide a clear cut and practical learning experiences on the aspect of social protection interventions that are being implemented in Uganda and the gaps that they are in and those that we could possibly fill using your respective uh, offices and mandates. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. And I think nearly all has been said. Before I invite uh, Honorable Flavia, I know Honorable Flavia will slightly hint something small on where we, where, where we are and where we want to be. But we had that part of the way forward. Among the few things I believe Gloria has noted some, among the few areas that we are noted as way forward one, we need to change the part of uh, having 0 0.7 of our GDP to be spent on uh, social development and instead take it up. It's at the lowest end, we need to take it up because if we change this, then the life will change for the rest of the community. Two, then, uh, as Cyrus pointed out about the champions, we already have five members of uh, MPs representing the older persons. I know those ones are key champions of this because it concerns them directly and it's one of the areas that uh, we need to... Honorable Santa, you are welcome. Flavia will, uh, will, <laughs> will introduce you later. And I, I think that is an area of the persons, one of the reasons why the president was insisting that we have MPs representing older persons was that uh, their interests were not being represented well. Now this is the time to see their interests represented and really championed and brought out in the open day light so that everybody can see. Cyrus equally pointed about uh, having another engagement concerning, uh, I believe, Patrick, we shall have another meeting where we shall invite more members of budget committee and uh, gender it's not that other committees are not a part of the struggle, but there are areas we are moving towards the, the budget period. So we need them to appreciate the whole program so that by the time we visit their committees, we really tell them what we want to do and how we need money in the budget. They are in position to know where we are coming from and what we are saying so that we can move together on the same page. As another way forward, the MP for, uh, for older persons also pointed out about the age group, 80. It was a struggle in the last parliament, but uh, colleagues who are there know where it came from and why it was so. Originally, there was an issue, but I think given that now government has uh, come in full board, 
it can be easier because the other time it government was imagining it could not be possible. By now I know, given that even our own is the chair of the gender committee, I know we shall reduce the age to where we want because all of you know that looking for somebody of 85 years or 90 or 81 in your village, the, the environment has properly kicked them out now that even COVID has come. Really, the conditions are tough that they can no longer handle. Most of those people are dead, so we can't have a group that we are looking after which is not existing. So we need to look into the age and see how best we can move. Somebody talked about also having in mind the issue of the girl child. It's an area that I know our secretariat has noted and uh, we, shall, uh, we shall see how best we can look into that. The MP for also older persons talked about the mess up in the yards. It's an area, the, those older persons didn't take it as a serious, they didn't know what it meant to have the right age. Others were not even bothered, others could not even remember. So most of them have missed on that money, but it's an area equally that we can address and see how best we can help them and move as we are supposed to move. I need to invite Honorable Flavia to say the closing mm -hmm. remarks. You see the, 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 the age that I've talked of on the identical cards. And the fingerprints are not reflected. And more especially now that everybody uh, washing hands using soap and sanitizer has even rubbed some of these, uh, your fingerprints can no longer read as it were. It's equal an area that the Secretariat can take a note of. We need to address it. Honorable Babadiri has something to say before Flavia comes in. She's the representative for the Northern Region. Give her the microphone. Uh, thank you very much uh, to our presenters. I would like to add something very small and see if you can be recommended into those who have included. One, regarding the older person's vulnerability, it is caused by us. At the beginning, when we are starting work, we don't think about our old age. In developed countries, they think of a pension right from the time they start work. Even from the age of 18, they think of what will, they, what will happen at their old age in the beginning of the building. But for us, this thing is just left only for those who are working, for those who uh, like in pen, like uh, uh, NSSF, those who are working. But I think it's important for our people to know that uh, they must begin serving right from the time they begin watching. Uh, and if it's possible, we should extend this contributory pension right to those who are not uh, employed formally. So that uh, if it means by force, like uh, paying taxes, say this money, at least 5,000 a year, must be saved for your uh, old age. So that by the time you reach that time, you have that money. Because for us, we are investing on our children, hoping that when they're educated, they will give us something. But we have realized that they don't. Once they're married, they forget about you. So we need to plan early enough, sensitize our people, and uh, if possible, put a law to ensure that you contribute something for your old age right from the beginning. Because we spend money luxuriously, drinking, uh, having women as many as possible when you are still strong. By the time you reach at old age, you have nothing. So I think we need to extend it so that everybody has this contributory a pension and uh, we have a better life when we are old. Then one example is uh, in the parliament, we never had this contributory uh, pension. Those who left in 2001, 2011, they went into real poverty. You have nothing. You have spent all your money for campaigns. Even you sold your houses for campaigns. 
and you fail on top, you have nothing. That's why we thought of that contributory pension, which is helping us. At least now, if I go out, I have something to rely on, to spend on. So it is important to send some people so that we start early enough. Thank you very much. Thank you, Baba. Patrick has noted that. Uh, Silas, you have something to say again? I felt it was very, very important that before we bring on board the new interventions, let's first have a drive to realize the deficit. The 32 billion, we didn't get it. So even before we talk about reducing the age and increasing the money, can we first cover the deficit? I thought it is something we should also capture in the way forward. Thank you. You have noted the issue of Cyrus. Cyrus has said we have a deficit. Originally, the Minister of Gender by then, Honorable Janet Mukai, was saying we don't have money as a government. So they were worried of where money would come from. Now, if we make a drive and realize the deficit of 32 billion, then we shall be in a position to tell them that, that this thing is possible. After making sure everything is ready, now we fight to reduce the age. We first fight to have the gap covered, then we bring another battle to reduce the age. If we begin a battle of reducing the age, before we have covered the, the other gap, they will tell us that we have even failed to cover this. Now you are pushing us to this. Yes, the, you are, the microphone is there. I, I wanted your eyes to see me. <laughs> That's why I stood up. I, I was just emphasizing what is said. Now for us, we are first timers in parliament, but we have experienced what the such thing did to the elderly persons in our communities. So if there was a budget shortfall, I think that can be considered within the push of going to beyond 1% of GDP. So, 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 so if you have one project which is doing very well, why don't we capitalize on that? Let's cover the gap, increase the number, we reduce the, the age to 60, and we see what numbers that would be. Yes, then you come to parliament and say, let's fund this thing 100%. Personally, I would be there. I have, uh, I'm not a very simple person. I have my friends who, in the budget committee who will be able to mobilize and provide that money. So, so the, what we want from you is an initiative. This thing we are telling you, cover the gap, reduce the number to 60, and we have the justification for, for reduction of age. The, the, 80, the 85 are dead. You don't deal with the numbers, people you don't have. So I thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. So his idea is let us first agree on reducing the age, then we push for the gap at once. Is that right? Kindly give a microphone to Honorable Santa to introduce herself. Thank you so much, uh, Chair. I want to first apologize because of coming late. It was due to some other unforeseen engagement earlier before this. Now, my name is Santa Alum, Member of Parliament representing Oyam District and the Secretary General for this uh, forum. Uh, allow me now, the, the, the last bit of the engagement, I think our Secretariat and the Chair gender needs to come up and help us in this because i remember the way we struggled to get all the districts on board and the argument of the honorable minister by then honorable saida bumba was that there is no money which can cater for the entire elderly from the age 65 we were even dealing with 65 not 60 so for me I would ask our secretariat and the chair budget to sit down because I don't want us to try and then we even lose everything. So, you know, the budget committee is strong so that you informed us which approach should we really, should we reduce the number to 60, for example, and we we increase the amount of money. Shall we be successful? 
just food for thought for the mind. Thank you. Okay, uh, uh, I think uh, Honorable, uh, uh, Honorable Chair of the session, we did modeling. So, so we did modeling, which we have, that we shall share formally. We now know that if we target 60, these are how many people by the census report that we can cover, and this is how much money that we would need. So we will we'll provide that. And then you, the policymakers, will look through and pick the most appropriate decision that you can make. Thank you. Yes, we, we have them. It was the case that we, because originally we were at 65, but in the 15 pilot districts. Those are some of the numbers that we put forward. And at the time, the parliament resolution was that let's have this and within five years, which ordinarily would be about 2024, that government would have slowly covered up to 65. So, Santa, there's a government commit, commitment that every year to review the age downwards so that many people can be targeted. So I think we can still hold government accountable on its own promise regarding that progressive realization to 65. Thank you. Honorable Flavia. You, if you can, what you can. Yes. The Honourable Members of Parliament, sitting on the Committee of Gender, and those Honourable Members sitting on the Committee of Budget, the technical people from Parliament, the Executive Committee of uh, Uganda Parliamentary Forum on Social Protection, the staff of Uganda Parliamentary Forum on Social Protection. Ladies and gentlemen, I am Kabahenda Flavia Rwabhoro. I represent the people of Chegegwa District. I am the committee chairperson for the Committee on Gender, Labor and Social Development. And I am the advocacy advisor for the Uganda Parliamentary Forum on Social Protection. I, I will plead with you to understand me when I cross from being the chair, talking as chairperson of committee to some, somehow talk as member of UPFSP. I will struggle to stay in the line because I'm supposed to speak here as the committee chairperson. I want to take this opportunity to thank the Uganda Parliamentary Forum on Social Protection for organizing this meeting. This is one of the noble meetings we should always have when we discuss about the people. Because me, I love the people. And I know that whatever we do as a country, we do it for the people. So we cannot love what we do for the people more than the people for whom we do it. And that is the reason why I want to really stand with uh, Lambert. We can do all the roads, we can do all the electricity, we can do every infrastructure. But for as long as we don't respect those for whom we do them, then we miss a point. That is when even the people we are doing these things for will never understand us. And so I, I want to really thank you for organizing this meeting. And I pray that it really switches on our, our, our brains to start understanding how we must invest in the people more than we invest in objects. Honorable members, Uganda is signed into a number of protocols. The ILO, the African Union Charter, the SDGs, the NDP3, the Vision 2020, the NRM Manifesto, and others, like you can think about them. The International Covenant on Cultural and Social Rights is one of them. And uh, it has ratified these protocols and it has committed to achieving them and it must even account 
to the to the other member states on how it is pro, pro, it is progressing. We are here to build blocks for social protection systems. And all these documents I have talked about provide a substantial framework from which we can begin designing, implementing, and monitoring social protection systems from a rights-based approach. When we talk about a rights-based approach, we are talking about the life cycle. And therefore, the honorable member who was worried about antenato, we are talking about a life cycle approach that tracks a person from the time that person drops into your womb up to when that person dies. That is what they call a system. And uh, we as uh, members of the Uganda Parliamentary Forum on Social Protection just piloted with SAGE. And therefore, I would like to, to tell you that social protection does not equal to SAGE. SAGE is just a component of the social protection aspects that we are supposed to oversee as members of parliament. So the convention, the ILO convention number 102 and also 202, compel a state responsibility. That the state has the overall responsibility to guarantee the proper administration of a social protection system, including ensuring financial sustainability, like the doctor was asking, and also to ensure that benefits are duly provided, minimum social protection requirements, and this was the biggest achievement of the 20th century. We cannot come out of it. Government is supposed to ensure sustainability, financial sustainability. So um, I don't know whether we want to sympathize with government or we want to put government to task to live to what is expected of it. And that is why we need the actual set of policies and programs designed to reduce poverty and vulnerability by promoting efficient labor markets, reducing people's exposure to shocks, and enhancing their capacity to protect themselves against hazards and loss of incomes. For social cohesion and inclusion and a dignified citizenry, we need a social protection system. We need to target appropriately. I will tell you, targeting older persons using identity cards, which you know are flawed. Honorable Dr. Sim, I want to tell you, it is not that the older person's thumbs could not be read by their biometric machines. These were fake. If their thumbs are read by the machines at the banks, why did these ones not read them? They were substandard machines, and we need to speak to that. We need to tell Nira to improve up their game. And so, you cannot now tag identity cards to the, to the targeting of older persons. And I want to bring good news at this, that Nira has written to the Permanent Secretary of the, of the Ministry of Gender to waiver the use of uh, national IDs to target the older persons. And well, yes, I would clap, but not much. Why can't it do across board? Because we can't use national IDs to target vulnerable persons. And that is why the Nabanza money did not actually go to the vulnerable. Because the vulnerable don't have the IDs. The vulnerable are the ones whose IDs were, 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 had been written mistaken age and mistaken names. And they could not rectify it, so they missed out. Uh, Honorable Chiaga will tell you what happened with the artists. How, did, how was the money distributed? The artists are one of those people who benefited from a relief fund, but I don't know whether it was the artists of Kampala or the artists of somewhere. I don't, I don't just understand it. Because you know that there were very, very many loopholes in even every relief money that was given everywhere. Why? Because we don't have a system. We don't have utilizable data. Up to now, the Minister of Gender will tell you they don't know the amount of older persons who are eligible. And it's a shame. We don't even have the populations of our children. Who has seen a birth certificate recently for a child in this country? What kind of country are we in 
that does not even want to own their children. We are, we, we are in shame. I mean, these are their IDs. They would be given wherever they, they take birth or at the subcounty chief's place. But it is not being done. So we are just running a country where whoever is in front will take, whoever is behind won't take. And as members of parliament, I think I need you to note that we have a number of questions to ask in as far as that is concerned. Of course, without preempting anything, NSSF amendments intend to widen and expand its scope to include voluntary savers, and this is intended to reduce informalities so that people can, uh, people can declare their incomes and people can save from their incomes. And secondly, it intends to enhance benefits, widen the scope of benefits from medical and invalidity, uh, and that discretion is being given to the minister. And of course, it is intending to offer midterm access because that is the talk of the day. Of course, this is just fire brigading. We need a system at the end of the day and, and, and many others. But uh, I think... Uh, in, in the very near future, we shall be concluding this on the floor of Parliament. The committee has done its job. We are, we are almost there. And uh, I want to think that we don't have more, very much time for it to be on the floor. And uh, so I want to allay the fears of all the people out there that uh, it is delaying. It was because we were trying to refine it as to, to, to speak to the people and not necessarily to the money. For us, we are looking at the people and uh, how they should live a dignified life. Someone talked about cohesion and inclusion. I think it was Lambert. I think you see the animosity now that is in the country. When, when, when a cyclist knocks a, a, a motorist and then they fight and at the end of the day, both are dead. It's because of those... E those kind of, of, of differences that people see. Because when someone who is a cyclist sees you riding a UBK that you bought just last week, you know the, the, the animosity that comes. Recently, if you have watched news, when people go to a, a, a someone's house and I'm a man at that, and then they put it on fire to burn him and his wife in and the children, you can imagine the animosity that the, the differences in income and, and, and standards of living is bringing. All of us are going to be hunted because people now think we owe them a living because they cannot be badly off and for us we are up here. So we need to think now or else each one of us will have to get an armored car if we are not careful. And so the idea of social protection and a system that is going to address people's vulnerabilities and shocks should be the talk now and not tomorrow because it is very paramount. And we know that close to 4 million children live with older persons of 60 and above. Close to 4 million children. So when we talk about lowering the age eligibility, then it means we are trapping more children into the net for support with the social protection. Of course, I would love that we link, we learn to link interventions of social protection in order to construct a system. One time, we went to meet the PSST, the former PSST and the budget officer in the Ministry of Finance. And of course, they were asking questions of, real, of sustainability on SAGE. But how are we going to sustain this? You know now, we, the people are living up to 63, so we are going to get very many older persons, and how will, you, will we sustain it? And then I looked at them. I asked myself, are you students of economics? Because you can't introduce youth livelihood support, and you introduce UEP, and you introduce a PWD grant, and you cannot even link that as a means of creating resilience to the effect that by the time these people are old, they will not need SEDGE. You see, in this country, we, we just operate on projects. So they think YLP has no relationship to SAGE. They think UEP has no relationship to SAGE. And yet, if we strengthen these, 
then these people, when they grow old, they wouldn't love sage. They would be already resilient. They would be standalone. And if we don't learn that as a country, then we are going to continue to pick and play. And I love when the doctor says, can we link this to PDM, sage to parish model? But it was not even linked to Emioga. There was no omoga for older persons. Was it there? No, it wasn't. There was omoga for women entrepreneurs. There were youths. There were everybody. There were no, say, there were no older persons in any of the enterprises of Emioga. So I don't know how we want to link it to PDM. Even when PDM is talking about agribusiness, agriculture, and you know that the older persons don't even have the energy to do agriculture. Nevertheless, we should be at the back of our minds, we should know that close to 60% of the land in the country belongs to older persons. And that is the reason why the younger people are fighting to, to clear them out so that they can grab land for free. But otherwise, most of the land in this country belongs to older persons. And therefore, linking them to PDM would be a good thing if there were people who think like that. And, uh, of course, linking interventions, the national social protection policy that is being reviewed now is making social protection everybody's business, from the family, from the family. It is very, very easy for a parent to raise his or her 15 children, one parent, but it is very difficult for the 15 children to look after their one parent. I don't know what happened, what went wrong. I just don't know. Maybe scientists. You know I'm an artist. Maybe scientists. Can you give us an explanation to that? That one parent can raise his or her children 15, 10, 15, and those children cannot even support their one parent. And that is where, that is where we all fall out. I think all of us have, show, have fallen short of the glory of God when it comes to that. And therefore, the National Social Protection emphasizes the family intervention on social protection, looking after people with disabilities, all the people that are vulnerable in our families, including, but not limited, to the older persons. We need utilizable data. The single registry this time must be financed Honorable members sitting on the budget committee, we have a single registry that was launched 2015. It has no utilizable data at all. And so all that comes because it is not, there is no financing for it. It has not been operationalized. And so uh, when we come with uh, such a request that there must be money and the single registry must not be pushed to the unfunded priorities, this is what we mean when we don't have data in every sector, no data of farmers, no data of animals, no data of older persons, no data of children, no data of women, then I think we are running a country on some system that I wouldn't want to mention now. Of course, honorable members, I would like to implore you that we, as we have SAGE in all our districts and constituencies, can you please link SAGE to the district development programs? What stops the district health officer from sending some health workers to a pay point so that they can take the pressure and diabetes of these older persons as they sit to wait for money? What's wrong with that? What's wrong with an agriculturist going to tell these older persons how they should feed, how they sh what kind of diet they require now at that age, what they should not be taking? what they should take, and many others. The commercial officers can even interest them in a small circle that even out of 25,000, you can save your 5,000 and then, and then try to use it later or try to use it as a bigger amount. So I would like that all your talks, either on radios or whatever you are in public, link SAGE to the district development programs so that these older persons I, uh, are assisted to understand and be educated on how to live a dignified life. Otherwise, members, uh, I would also add my voice to the other members who are calling on all of us to become members of the Uganda Parliamentary Forum on Social Protection. 
I'm glad that there is a list for, from where we can uh, enlist ourselves. And don't worry, we are not those who are going to start scrapping your money as uh, immediately you write. You just commit to us that you'll be a member and subscribe. Our subscription fee is only 30,000, but at your consent, because when you don't consent, of course, we can't even move on to, tackle, to, to, to tap on it. Otherwise, uh, members and uh, the Uganda Parliamentary Forum on Social Protection, I thank you for inviting us here, for reminding us that this belongs to us, the discussion on social protection, and uh, the budgeting period coming will find us alive to the matter and we shall do whatever it takes to ensure that uh, we build a system, building blocks for a social protection system. I thank you very much for listening to me. And uh, I would like to announce that the Committee on Gender, Labor and Social Development will sit in the conference hall B at 2 p.m. Thank you very much. I wish you a wonderful day, a wonderful week. And uh, as you go, don't stop thinking about a social protection system. Thank you so much. Thank you, Honorable Flavia. I'm, I don't wish to have an oversight where maybe the chairperson of budget committee delegated somebody. When we didn't see him in the room, we imagined he had not delegated anybody. Could there be somebody who has been delegated by the chairperson budget committee? That's why we invited the, the one who was last. Okay. Because we don't want to be reported. Somebody can go back and say, you left me there, but they didn't even give me a chance to, to give <laughs> some comment. Thank you. After the closing remarks by the chairperson, I wish to equally thank you for coming and wish you a blessed day.